Welcome to Cravings Control for Fat Loss. I'm your host, Laura Cavallo, former sugar binger, overeater, and yo-yo dieter turned fat loss and cravings coach for hundreds of busy women. Here at Cravings Control for Fat Loss, I'll be sharing mindset, movement, and metabolism strategies for those who are ready to ditch the fat diet cycle and slim down without counting calories, tracking points, or giving up any of the foods they love. Get ready to embrace progress over perfection, grace over guilt, and bring curiosity and learning to the inevitable ups and downs of your life. Expect a decrease in your cravings while seeing and feeling an improvement in how you look, how you feel, and your overall quality of life. I am so excited you're here, boo. Let's get started. On today's episode, you'll hear from Cravings Code client, Trisha, who I first connected with on Instagram this past January. Trisha opens up about her lifelong struggle with her weight and dieting. She admits she's known for a long time that she wanted to break free from diet culture and have a better relationship with food and improve her health. But it was the Cravings Code that gave her the tools and accountability to do it in a way that felt manageable. You'll hear right from Trisha about the changes she's experienced around her food habits and mindset, how she went on her first vacation during the Cravings Code without self-sabotaging, and the tools and strategies she's currently using to stay on track and reinforce the healthy habits she's been striving for all along. I hope her story can inspire and encourage you to know that there is a way to live free of cravings, free of stress and anxiety, and full of confidence, control, and ease. I hope that you enjoy the show. Hey there, boo. I am so excited to announce that another round of The Cravings Code will open for enrollment this September. If you haven't heard, The Cravings Code is for women who struggle with overeating, constant cravings, and insatiable hunger, and are ready to get them under control while shifting their all-or-nothing thinking around diet, around exercise, and their health. What you can expect is up to a 70% decrease in your cravings, in your hunger, and your overeating, and prime yourself to naturally eat fewer calories and sustainably lose weight if that's one of your goals. The best part of all this There's absolutely no eliminating your fun foods, there's going to be no fad dieting, and there are no gimmicks. As a result of the strategies and tools I'm going to teach you, you're going to see your guilt, your shame, and the stress around food slowly fade away. I guarantee it. If this sounds like something you need and are interested in, go below and add your name to the waitlist. By adding your name, there is absolutely no commitment to join, but you do get an option to enroll early at a majorly discounted rate. More details coming in August, and I'll see you there. Hi, Trisha. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Laura? I'm good. Thanks. I am tuning in from the East Coast. You're in Colorado, right? I am. Yes. Where it's extremely hot this week after lots of rain. Yeah, can't figure it out anymore. Just nope. just cannot figure out the weather anymore. And it's it's kind of sad, honestly, what's going on around the country. But we are not going to dive into that today. We're not going to dive into that. I think that's really good. We, we yeah. can't solve that. Not for no. us to solve today. Not, not right now. Not right now. Well, I want to thank you for agreeing and being willing to share your story on the podcast and to come on and just you know, kind of like shed some layers and and be really honest and transparent about your own experience with health and weight loss and fat loss and diet culture and your challenges with cravings and, you know, where you are now and after even just like a short period of time working together. So I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's, I'd love to just kind of start from the beginning and just hear more about sort of like you growing up and your upbringing and kind of I guess, like, what really set the tone for you in terms of your challenges when it came to cravings and overeating? And you talk a lot about diet culture in our current program and how that's really been had such a stronghold on you for such a long time. So I'd love to to hear more about that. Yeah, sure. So in prepping for our conversation today, I spent some time thinking about that. Like, where, where did that start for me or when and how? And I think it just right? Like I was born in the mid eighties, grew up in the nineties. And I think just sort of thinking through that time, it was so prevalent. Like I remember lots of like Weight Watchers ads and Jenny Mm -hmm. Craig ads and, you know, like diet soda and low fat crackers. And I just feel like, you know, from an early age, I can remember feeling like there was always this idea that if your body wasn't super thin, you should want to change it. 
Mm. Right. Like that Mm. just, I think is a message that I have heard through a lot of my life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think my, my mom and my family unit was somewhat susceptible to that. You know, I think, you know, some people talk about that being like a huge part of their household or their, their parents really were hard on that. And I don't, I wouldn't say that it necessarily came from my mom, although I don't think she, you know, counteracted it either. It was just kind of, you know, a function of that, right? Like that the really thin body was desirable and that the way to get Mm -hmm. that was to restrict your calories. Like you had to be disciplined to have this ideal body type. And so, I mean, I, for sure, like as early as high school, I can remember thinking that my body should be thinner. And Mm -hmm. now I'm like, that was 30 pounds ago. (laughs) Right. (laughs) should be thinner. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so how did that man- – thank you for sharing that. How did how did that manifest itself as a kid? Were you – did you have slim fast shakes at home? Were you actively trying to buy some of these products? Were you watching your weight or weighing yourself or wishing you were a size 2 when you were buying a size 6 or 8 yeah. or 10 or 14? How did that manifest itself for you? Yeah, I think for me that started coming up more in like my early 20s, maybe a little bit in college. I – have always had like a more curvier athletic build. Like I've never been super thin. That's just not how I'm cut. But I think I'm, oh, I've been, you know, a healthy size. When, what does that mean? Really? <laughs> That's another diet culture word. But We love athletic and, and curvy. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, in high school, there was times where I was like, I have, I have more junk in my trunk than some girls, you know, mm-hmm. but like I wasn't, I didn't feel that that was necessarily a bad thing. I just knew like I carried more weight on my bottom half, but definitely like as I got out of college and got into my, you know, early mid twenties and you're not like you're, I work a desk job. I started sitting in a desk. My movement changed, you know, I'm cooking for myself and just different stuff where I think I started to gain weight. Mm -hmm. And that was then where I started feeling like, oh, I need to do something. Like I did Weight Watchers and things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So starting around that, that time, probably in my twenties where that started to come into fruition, like all that messaging that I always heard is like, well, now my body's not as thin as it used to be. So I should, I obviously need to do something to change that. Right. Right. I need to put efforts towards watching what I'm eating, restricting my calories, buying the 100 calorie snack packs, things like that. Totally. Someone I follow on Instagram, she's a dietitian, and she, a lot of her content is around past commercials from the 80s and 90s. And like, you wonder where we got our ideas of needing to be thinner and restrict calories from. And almost like every three or four days, there's a new clip from either a full house episode or a commercial or some sort of print media steering the conversation towards watching your calories, fitting into the bathing suit, being smaller, being thinner, being more being more desirable. And these are things I don't remember, right? I don't remember right. because it was so long ago, but also because I think we just kind of took it at face value and like, oh, that's normal quote. That's that's, you know, what it is. And we had slim fast around the house. And in terms of my family, there wasn't a lot of discussion around weight, um, except for my mom like growing up a little bit heavier and my grandma making her go on diets, but there wasn't this like um, pressing need to be on a diet or, or be a certain right. weight. But anyway, I digress. I, I just wanted to bring that up. And for anyone that's listening, I will share that dietitian's Instagram below so you can yeah. go and- I'm going to check it out too. Yes. It's so fascinating. And I remember these commercials, like the Yo Play 100 calorie yogurt. And it's like this woman looking at this bathing suit on in January and then in February and then walking by and looking at it in March and she's eating the yogurt and she's working out and she's, and then in just, and then like, the clip goes to June and the bathing suits off the rack and she's like, I did it, you know? And so, so I know. So yeah. When did a hundred calories become like the magic number of the amount you're allowed to have right. at one time? <laughs> right. And now we wonder why we're all hungry, right? We're like why we were hungry back then because not even a snack should be a hundred calories, right? We want it to be a little bit more substantial like that, at, you know, for the average person at least. Yeah. So was Weight Watchers your first diet in your 20s? Yep. And tell us more about that progression of, you know, cooking, figuring out your awareness around body image, starting Weight Watchers and what that looked like throughout your 20s and 30s. Yeah. So I think I didn't, like we didn't do a lot of 
cooking. I don't come from a cooking family. I don't have cooking genes. Like I don't cook a lot at home. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Mm -hmm, Definitely. (laughs) Sometimes it feels like to eat healthy, you have to be a gourmet chef. And that was not the case for me. It's still not the case. And I work full time, you know, so even if I enjoyed cooking, which I don't really. So being busy is not the only reason I don't cook. (laughs) But, you know, all of a sudden you're like a working professional and you have to be responsible for feeding yourself and you have to feed yourself more than like cereal and milk for dinner. Right, right. (laughs) So I, you know, I think Weight Watchers was popular. And so that was, I think, somewhere where I turned to to sort of learn what healthy eating looked like or what appropriate portion sizes were. I remember, you know, like the point system and, you know, here's different recipes, like making Weight Watchers recipes for different stuff. And it worked, you know, when I wanted it to, I feel like I would lose, you know, like 10 or 15 pounds maybe. And then, you know, I'd go back to doing normal stuff and then I'd go through like a stressful or busy time and I'd just like gain it all back and usually like plus a little bit more. Right. 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 And then I'd get like uncomfortable in my body and be like, oh, I should do that again. You know, so I'd like restrict. And I even I know like many times over the years I've had the thought process of like, yeah, this all this restricting really sucks, but it's only for a short period of time till I get back to that ideal size. Mm -hmm. And then what I've learned over, you know, the last couple of years is I've tried to understand, you know, how the body works a little bit more. It's like it makes sense to me now why each time I did that, when the weight came back, I actually gained like a little bit more, Mm -hmm. lose a little Mm -hmm. and like gain a little bit more back because you're, you know, it's like basically putting my body into starvation mode and overly restricting and then wanting to just, once I went back to quote normal, it was like way over indulging Mm -hmm. because I had been restricting to get to that, whatever the ideal size was. Right. Right. And to, to clarify Sometimes when we restrict for a longer period of time, the metabolism can slow down, right? So say you as a, you know, working woman in your 20s, you're burning 1800 calories per day. And then you went down to, you know, did your Weight Watchers and maybe for four, eight, 12 weeks, you were eating 1500 calories, right? I mean, like 12, right? probably like 12 to 14. I mean, it's, it blows my mind now to think that that was perceived as a reasonable amount. <laughs> right. So what happens during this time is now your metabolism adapts. Right. Right. It says, okay, well, Trisha has been eating 1400, 1200 calories for the last like four, six weeks. We need to slow down because we're not going to be able to keep her alive. We're not going to be able to focus on reproductive functioning, hormone functioning, proper digestion, proper thought processes. So now your metabolism adapts and it becomes harder to lose weight and you have to start to eat less and less. So to your point, when you went back to normal eating, you're like, well, I'm eating what I was eating before, but now your metabolism has slowed down. So that's why sometimes women can gain some weight coming out of a diet period because now the metabolism slowed down and it's not at that maintenance. Right. So I just wanted to clarify that for our listeners and for you. Yeah. Starvation mode isn't really a thing. Right. But we use it kind of interchangeably sometimes when we're talking about our metabolism slowing down and holding on to fat, but it's because the metabolism adapts. Yeah. We got to keep you alive. I think the other thing I've learned from you that now like looking back related to the cravings, like I think what would happen after I went off the diet is I would start eating all of those sort of like crave, you know, high sugar, high fat foods in excess. So I wasn't really going back to eating normally. Mm. It was sort of all those things that I had restricted. I was eating way too much of them because I hadn't let myself have any of them. Right. And this diet culture mentality was like, I'm just weak. I have no self-control, you know? And so starting to unpack that a little bit has been so helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And so now I can look back and say, oh, now I know why, you know, once I took the restriction away, I went all out because it, it was sort of like absolutely nothing or absolutely everything. And I ping ponged back and forth on that for 10 years now, you know. And that whole time you were doing Weight Watchers? No, like I stopped for a while and then tried Whole30. Mm -hmm. I think I did a couple of Whole30s. And that in some ways was different because I liked this idea of, you know, not like counting calories and tracking things. Mm -hmm. But the restriction there was like the type of food that you could have, which was really restrictive, which also did not work well for me. And then I had my kids. So I got, you know, pregnant, which changes your body a ton. And then I tried Noom after my kids were born. I feel like that was branded as like a more, you know, a more psychologically healthy weight loss. Mm -hmm. Like then I started to see like, oh, Weight Watchers isn't that good because it's overly restrictive. 
and this one's better. But through all that time, I started to be more and more aware of sort of this unhealthy relationship that I had with food and with my body image. And I have two daughters and I don't want to raise them with the same kind of body image Mm -hmm. that I have, right? Like I want them to love themselves and not label food as bad or good. And, you know, all these things that now I'm trying to reverse Mm -hmm. after having them be a part of my life for over 30 years, I want to set the right framework for them. And it just became really obvious to me probably about a year ago. There's no way that I can do that for them if I don't, if I'm not in the right space myself. Wow. Wow. I have chills. I have chills. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. They're very cute. They're very cute. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I love them and I want them to love themselves the way I love them. Yes. And not the way that I have not loved myself for so long. Yeah. And how you're unraveling now as well and learning to love yourself more now. Totally. And I love your awareness. I love your honesty and the reflection that you've had over the last year, three years, 10 years of solely being like, this isn't fitting. This isn't working. This doesn't feel aligned. Right. But for so long, we just don't know what else to do. Right. Right. Because from marketing perspective, all of these diets are interface. We're seeing, you know, these before and after photos of people going from being overweight to fit and quote unquote, we think healthy. And so we're like, well, I guess we'll try that. Right. We don't know that there's an alternative. There's a, a lifestyle approach. There's a more sustainable approach. And that it takes time if you do want to lose weight sustainably, if you do want to reverse some of these unhealthy nutritional and diet mindset and mentality. It takes time, right? It doesn't take 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And something you shared about the story you were telling yourself about, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough. I see this so, so often. So many women coming in and feeling ashamed that they failed, feeling ashamed that they weren't able to do it. And I've had clients I worked with for a year, two years, who finally started opening up to me about, yeah, I was like tracking and, you know, I was doing the 1200 calories and I was doing cardio to earn and burn and just wasn't successful. And finally being okay with like, I know that didn't work for a reason and it wasn't the right approach. And and so I want to validate that. You know, I want to validate the feelings of not feeling accomplished or or capable or good enough when it comes to achieving some of these unattainable results that that are put in front of us. So I'm really happy that we met and that you joined the Cravings Code. And now you can start to unravel and move forward with much healthier perspective. And you can influence your daughters who will influence their friends and who will influence, you know, their kids if they end up having kids. Yeah. Um, were there any other stories that you were telling yourself along the way? And you, you shared a little bit. And if there's nothing else, that's totally fine. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, as you're talking through all of this, I'm just nodding the whole time, right? It's exactly that. It's, um, you know, I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough willpower. I think that's sort of what you think over time. And you do see like all these before and after pictures and think people are, you want a quick fix, right? But I'm thinking like, okay, I've been trying to lose, you know, my youngest daughter's three. So I'm like, I've been trying to lose the same 15 pounds the fast way (laughs) for three years and it doesn't work, you know? And so I think the time has passed anyways. So really trying to remove from my head this idea of a certain timeline or even a certain number, because in hindsight, looking back, right? Like 30 pounds ago, I thought I wanted to lose 15 pounds, right? right? And now that's my goal weight, you know? So it's like, maybe the problem isn't the number on the scale, it's what's in here, what's in my head and right. really kind of fixing that. You nailed it, right? Because if we achieve a certain number on the scale or a certain look, we don't automatically increase our confidence. It doesn't just confidence turn on, turns on once that number is hit, right? Confidence is something that we can choose to have right now in the body that we have, in the extra weight that we might carry or the clothes that we wear that are a bigger number, right? We can choose to have that confidence and that self-acceptance now. And it doesn't have to mean anything. It doesn't have to mean that it's bad or it's good or it's less desirable or attainable than 
a smaller size, right? It's the value that we attribute to it. Right. Of course, we've been impacted by society. Of course, we're impacted by how things are marketed to us. Even as I get on Instagram, it's always oftentimes people that are size two or size four. And now there's more efforts towards showing more bigger bodied, able bodied, even just different types of people, like people like me and you. <laughs> and so hopefully in time, it can become more inclusive, but the mindset takes work, right? And I always go back to Lizzo. I don't know why. I just, I, sh- I think she's just such a badass. Like, right. Yeah. You know, she is someone that exercises daily. She shows up, she's fit, she shows up for her body, but she's just a bigger girl. You know, does she have more fat on her body? Sure, but she chooses to show up confidently and own her shit. She's not skinny, right? You don't have to be skinny to be confident and I just like using her as an example because it goes to show like she's just trying to create the best version of herself right not Mm -hmm. this best version as compared to anyone else and you know towards the end of our conversation I'm I'd like to chat more with you about like your current goals and I know it's shifted from fat loss to more lifestyle based habits building strength and setting better examples for your kids so want to talk a little bit more about that, but you and I just met recently. Yeah. Like we just um, connected in January and we chatted a little bit on Instagram and then you joined the Cravings Cleanup Challenge, which is a free seven-day challenge walking you through a satisfied plates, but you had already taken it upon yourself and started building satisfied plates even before the Cravings Cleanup Challenge, which I thought was amazing. You're like, I'm already doing it and I'm seeing results and I'm feeling great. I'm like, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Love this. Yeah. So tell me about your initial transition into Satisful Plates and how that felt. Was it scary? Was it like exciting? Tell me all the things. Yeah. So like I I kind of mentioned before, I've been on a little bit of this journey, I would say for a year or so. It was probably about a year ago that I decided I was not going to sort of like fad diet or crash diet anymore. I was like, this isn't serving me. It's not healthy. It's not working. Um, But I didn't quite know what was next, right? So I I knew that I needed to heal my relationship with food and my body, but I wasn't quite sure how. And so like we all do these days, started trying to follow some different content on Instagram and people that, you know, were sharing things along those lines. And some of the pages, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk in some spaces about like macro tracking. And I liked that general idea, you know, as I understood like why eating a good amount of protein is good for your body and, you know, a balanced amount of other food groups and eating more fruit and veggies and things like that. But I just, the tracking was so cumbersome to me, like even tracking macros compared to calories, I found it so exhausting. And part of that is being you know, working full time, having two kids, like it's just the time to like put something in a tracker that I didn't want to take. But I, it's also triggering for me because of the many years that I've done that. And so uh, when I, you know, first found your page and I saw Sat Us Full Plates, I just, it was really connected with me. I think hearing some of your story mirrored so much of mine, mm-hmm. like trying all these different things, looking for the magic answer. So that was what really drew me to you in the first place. And then the saddest full plates approach, I was like, wow, this is so simple. Like I can build a plate that has components that are going to serve me and serve my body and feel good. And I don't have to track them. I don't have to measure something. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get out of food scale, right? Like some really well-intentioned people who I think have a great approach. It's like, well, weigh everything. I'm like, there's no effing way I'm ever going to weigh every piece of food that goes into my mouth. Like that is not for me. And not to judge people that are interested in doing that because they have a specific goal in mind, but it's just not the right fit for me. Yeah. So I, Satisful Plates to me just really resonated. It was like, here's, you know, a great way to put together something. And Mm -hmm. I think I would say when I first started doing it, it was again, very much with a weight loss or fat loss goal in mind. But I noticed pretty quickly that it made a difference in my snacking in the afternoon, which was so eye-opening for me because I found like, it wasn't like I was eating nothing for breakfast. You know, I was eating somewhat healthy. I don't even know if I have a good example, but you know, I'd like two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon would come and I just feel like ravenous for you know, like popcorn, chips, a cookie, even if I was eating like an apple and peanut butter or something healthy, I was starving, you know, between mid-afternoon and dinner time. And then 
I'd eat dinner and I'd put my kids to bed and I would, as soon as they went to bed, I'd want to have like a snack, Mm -hmm. you know, a bowl of crackers and a little scoop of ice cream. Like, right. And I felt like I'm hungry. You know, I want, I'm, I need to eat these things. And part of me knew that the cravings were emotional, but part of me was like, no, my stomach is grumbling. Right. Like I'm actually hungry for these things. Right. Just doing satisfying breakfast, like nothing else, I started to notice a difference in that. Wow. And learning from you, even a little bit in the cravings cleanup challenge, but especially in cravings code, sort of the science of that and why that happens. It just was so eye-opening to me. Like I could go back and say, oh, I'm not getting snacky because I'm weak or have no willpower. Right. Like, right. And it was the permission I needed to let myself off the hook. Yes. You know? Yes. So yeah, there's a very long answer to your question, but I think I know, please, please. And you know, women need to hear this and there's women like that have struggled just like you and myself that are currently struggling that are asking themselves, what's my solution? You know, how can I get out of this? And you and I both know that it feels so desperate and it feels so endless and hopeless. And so share as much as you you want, please. Because I can say it, but people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, like you're the cravings queen. Like your cravings are gone. But to hear from someone that's gone through it most recently, I think it's it's really empowering. So something you said that really stood out is oftentimes when we experience cravings, a lot of us go to that, I'm not strong enough. I'm going to ruin everything. Why is this happening? And we fall kind of like in this more of a victim role because we don't realize that there's an actual why to the craving, right? We don't realize that, oh, I'm just friggin' tired or I'm just really stressed at work or I am going through an emotional time period right now. You know, maybe I'm really happy or I'm really sad or I just haven't eaten enough and I've been restricting my like something that I really want for the last couple of days. And so having that why is freeing. It's permission. It's an answer that takes it out of the willpower, takes it out of I'm not strong enough, takes it away from something that's wrong with us as a person. Right. Because now we, we've got yeah. solutions for this shit, right? We've got solutions for this now, which is good news. Yep. Yeah. And you want to honor, at least for me going on this journey, I think a lot of people that find themselves in your corner of the internet, like they want to be in the space of intuitive eating and having like a healthy relationship with food. So then it's like, well, my body says it wants crackers, so I should eat all the crackers, you know? And I, but I knew it wasn't making me feel good. It was Mm -hmm. giving me like heartburn after I ate it and stuff. So I was really yearning for that space where I could honor what my body was asking for, but also give my body what it needed. Mm-hmm. And that is something I've really found with your your programs Yeah, uh, to be so helpful. Yeah. It combines the best of both worlds, right? How can we nourish our body? How can we build strength? How can we build lean muscle? How can we poop daily? How can we have high mood, good energy? And also be like, oh shit, I want to eat this so bad. I cannot wait to have, you know, this meal. I can't wait to, to, to indulge right with more of those foods that actually, actually help us feel good. Another thing that you said, that's really important for people to understand is the macro counting, the macro tracking just didn't feel aligned with your needs of your life, right? Your, your schedule, your life demands, the mental bandwidth that you had. And I think so often we try to fit a square peg into a round hole and we're like, just this is going to, this, this is supposed to work, right? Macros is supposed to work. I'm going to force it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it before you know it. You're stressed out. You're going crazy. And then you totally give up. And you even said earlier, like, I don't like cooking. I don't come from a cooking family. Like fucking cool. That's fine. Like, let's lean into that. Let's work with it instead of being like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I can't cook. I don't like to cook. Like what type of woman am I that I don't like to cook? Like I'm the same way. I don't like cooking, right? I'm. Nope. That's why Satisfull Plates is perfect because I can just have some protein, have some fruits, have some veggies, have some of my favorite crave foods and and build it without even cooking anything or spending hours at the stove. So this is just a reminder for anyone listening that you want your nutrition protocol to feel aligned with your lifestyle, your demands, your schedule. It shouldn't give you anxiety and it should feel like something that will become more effortless and easy with time. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. And I think honoring the idea that like a meal doesn't have to be something fancy, right? Like I, you know, do a lot of 
like a bag of frozen veggies and, you know, like chicken sausage or, yep. you know, like it's very easy. Like no one would serve what I make at a restaurant, but it's good for me and my family. And I think it's perfect. So, yeah. And I'm very similar that it's very basic meals. And sometimes I'm like, should I be posting recipes? Should I be like coming up with recipes? But it's just not who I am. I'm not like, I made this incredible chopped salad with mandarin oranges. I'm just like, no, like I, that's not who I am. <laughs> like if I, I usually find people's recipes and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make that. So. But then do you read them? And you're, I'm always like, that is so many steps. Like I don't even. <laughs> it's so many ingredients. It's so many things. I don't have time. Like I tried HelloFresh, you know, or whatever, but I'm like, but I still have to cook the food. Yeah. Like it's great that they shop and send you all the ingredients, but like I still have to do all the work. Yep, exactly. So find what works for you and, and honor that, right? Honor yeah. that. So after the Cravings Cleanup Challenge, you immediately signed up for the Cravings Code. You were like the first person that signed up. You're like, I'm, I'm doing this. What made you decide to join the Cravings Code um, after just a short period of time working with Satisful Plates? And yeah. tell me about your experience in the Cravings Code. Yeah. So I think the thing for me was I knew what I should do, at least at a top level, yeah. but having some accountability um, and some support, I think it was going to be essential for me. Like it was just, it had been too easy for me over the years to give up on myself uh, when things got hard or something didn't turn out how I expected. And so the cravings code to me was taking what I had learned, building on that and making sure that there was a guide through that system because I knew there was going to be at least one point that I would be hard on myself or think that I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I just really deeply felt that I needed somebody to help me get out of my own head and out of my own way. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was the motivation for me in signing up. And then I think the execution of it was exactly that. Right. So I think, you know, filling things in on the weekly reflection forms and having you provide feedback on that was really helpful. Having, a small number of other women in the group and sharing their challenges. I think sometimes that that's helpful because it's so normalizing, mm-hmm. right? You're like, oh, I'm not the only person that feels this way or that this is a struggle for. And so that I found really, really helpful as well is just that small community of we're all in this together mm-hmm. uh, was really, and it's, you know, I've done that before with like a friend, you know, we do like Weight Watchers or Noom together but sometimes weirdly it would feel competitive. Like, I don't know why it shouldn't. Right. But I feel like that's still a byproduct of some of the old shit that we're trying to get beyond. Yes. And so doing it with this group of people that this was the only thing I had in common with them allowed it to, to be collaborative and supportive and not feel competitive. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, that accountability that quote unquote, staying on track that you really needed throughout the program you totally did that. You totally killed it. Like you went on vacation. I did. You got super busy at work and you just came back and were like, I was eating satisfied plates and I was hiking and I was doing this and I totally killed it. So tell me, tell me about that experience. Do you remember going on that vacation? And that was like very early on in the cravings code too, I feel like. It was, yeah, I think a couple of weeks in. It, that was such a turning point for me because I think so often we go on vacation or um, I had like a, my dad had some health stuff come up a couple of weeks after that, that I was pretty deeply involved in. And so my history was always like, I go on vacation or I have a stressful event and I go totally off the rails. Like, again, it's all or nothing. Like I'm either all in on this program or I'm saying fuck it and eating whatever I want. <laughs> and I didn't do that, right? Like I went on vacation and like, yeah, I definitely ate more crave foods. Like I was at someone else's house. So, you know, there was not as many protein options at breakfast as I would have liked at home, but I was able to do the best I could. And I didn't feel like, oh, I can't eat that because I'm on this diet Mm -hmm. or like, you know, well, I'm just going to have eight pancakes for breakfast because, you know, like I could find that space in the middle and when I came home from vacation, I felt like, okay, here's like the minor tweak I'm making to get back to where I was, right? Like it didn't, it just didn't feel like this whiplash, like it always has been before. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's phenomenal. So happy for you. Yeah. That was awesome. Was it like a girl's trip for your birthday? Am I remembering that correctly? 
Um, it wasn't my birthday, but we it was a, I was with some friends from college, and we had our kids were there too. So Aww. it was like a, a girls' trip with kids. Our kids are all, are all around the same age, so it's fun to see them. Super cute. I love that. Yeah. And so in the past, I don't know for you, but like whenever I'd go out to eat or on vacation or, you know, was around other people and I was dieting, I'd get a lot of questions, right? Or like, why are you doing that? Or what you're not drinking? Or, oh, you have to track this? Or why'd you bring your own food? Did you get any questions from anyone? Did you get any pushback? Or could you just kind of go about your day normally and not feel like it was like really impeding in any way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually didn't even mention it to anybody. Like my husband, knows but because for me the mentality of all of this has been like this isn't an event like I'm not on a diet I'm not doing a program for a short period of time like I'm improving my life and the Mm -hmm. way that I eat and the way that I move my body and the way that I show up so I didn't feel like I needed to tell people like hey I'm doing this I could look at the food options that were available and make a choice that fit for me and that I knew would serve my body and you know, we had, it was my friend's birthday while we were there. So we had birthday cake and I was like, I'm going to have birthday cake. And you know what? I want ice cream with my birthday cake too. And is this something I'm going to do every day? No, but am I going to feel guilty about doing that today? Also no. Yeah. Wow. What a departure. What a departure. Yeah. And so what tools specifically did you feel resonated with you the most as you went through these six weeks of the cravings code? And, and even now, as you are continuing on with these strategies, And just to refresh your mind, we had the 80-20 continuum, cornerstone habits, correcting sleep and stress, consistently satisfied, chest exercise. What out of those cornerstone habits, Any anything really stick with you? Yeah. I mean, all of it in some ways, but as I've moved forward, cornerstone habits has been probably the most essential for me uh, because we came out of Cravings Code and I did get into a really busy season at work. And so being able to just say, here's the three things that I told myself that I would do every day, no matter what. And they feel really manageable, right? Like they, you know, it's eating two out of my three meals every day, making sure that those are satisfied, getting steps in for me, like movement. I work a desk job. So getting up and walking is really important. And then water is the other one for me because, Mm -hmm. you know, I think when you're hydrated, it's just, it's so much more helpful. And so those to me are such, they're low hanging fruit and it makes such a huge difference in how... I feel and then it impacts everything else. So Mm -hmm. that piece is huge. And then, you know, I do think the chess exercise is helpful for me to go back to because it is like when you're feeling like eating something, you're having a craving, like where, where is this coming from? And it doesn't mean that you are, aren't going to honor the craving, but for sure, I've been having more cravings in the last about week or 10 days because I've been super busy at work. I didn't have time to do any food prep over the weekend. Um, so I, I don't feel like my satisfied lunch has been as satisfied as it mm-hmm. should be. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I am a little snackier in the afternoon and I know why and I know, you know, how to fix it. Uh, love that. That is also extremely helpful to just honor that. Yeah. Yeah. And Cornerstone is so helpful for people that tend to self-sabotage because the self-sabotage mentality is if we aren't able to do things perfectly or things aren't going as planned or this isn't how I want it to go, then fuck it. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Right. But that is not true. And I think you can attest to this and a lot of other people that have gone through the program, like you said, water and two out of three satisfied plates. Those things make such a difference, even though they're so simple and they're so, I don't say easy because they're not, but they're just really basic habits. Right. And so Cornerstone really allows you to step out of that all or nothing mentality and say, I can do these two, three things really well. And these two, three things are actually going to be super worth it for how I feel at the end of the day and and at the end of the week. So for anyone that is struggling with self-sabotage, Cornerstone habits is definitely something that can help you throughout the cravings code. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. All right. I know you talked about some aha moments along the way, but was there anything that surprised you the most in the program as you went through? Like, was it like being able to go on vacation and come back and get back on track? Was it how your energy and your mood changed? Was it more about your mindset? Was it that this was really simple and you could do it from anywhere? Anything that was an aha moment for you throughout the program? Yeah, those for sure. I think the biggest thing for me that has kept me like committed to this moving forward was how big of a difference 
eating a satisfying breakfast and lunch makes in the rest of my day, right? Like, I mean, within a week, I was no longer feeling like I had to have 800 snacks after my kids were in bed. Right. Like it's to go from where I was feeling in like January, February of like sort of insatiable like cravings or appetite in the afternoon at work and at home and to just have those like basically disappear through something that seemed so easy, right? Like I'm just comprising this plate in this way and satisfy is great because it's like, it includes crave, right? Like you're putting something that you enjoy on that plate. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're restricting. I just honestly could not believe the difference in how my body felt related to food and cravings Mm -hmm. from just doing those two meals that Mm -hmm. way. Like I didn't even, we did breakfast in the cravings cleanup challenge and I had been doing that before. And then I added lunch, but I was still kind of like, you know, flexible on dinner, doing the best that I could. But even just from like setting myself up early in the day, I'm like, holy cow, it's night and day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the reason Satisful was likely so effective for you, and and you mentioned this, was A, from like an actionable and applicable standpoint, you're filling up earlier in the day, right? You're not waiting until nighttime to eat. But also from a mindset perspective, you're allowing yourself that food that traditionally has been off limits for you. Right. So you're allowing yourself that baked muffin, a half of a baked muffin or that bacon or some of that granola that's like, you know, got more sugar in it. But like you're like, I'm making it satisfying. And now you're like you got that yum yum factor from your meals. And that's what I love about the cravings code strategies and even some of the slim six strategies is that we're marrying application with mindset change, mm-hmm. right? And and as you do these habits more and they become routine, your mindset now starts to shift because you kind of buy into the process. You are starting to see the results. You're starting to see the changes. And now your mindset has to follow. You're like, oh shit, like I am not overeating at night, right? And I can actually have half a slice of toast or a muffin or whatever, And I'm not binging on it at night, huh? Maybe there's something to not restricting, right? Maybe there's something to allowing these foods in my diet so that I don't end up eating them all at night. And so that's something that I really value within the program and the strategies is it's multi-layered, right? We've got the the action and we've got the, the mindset strategy behind it. So at the end of the six weeks, what results did you experience? Was it reduced cravings? Was it improved sleep? Was it improved confidence? Yeah. Anything in the way of energy, mood, hunger, cravings, like anything else that you want to share with us? Yeah. I mean, so my cravings were down enormously, you know, not even by the end, by halfway through, by a couple weeks in and the ability to stick with that, you know, that was huge. And my mindset around it, right? Like I feel like to me, it really felt like this is a lifestyle, right? Like I'm not on a diet. I'm not thinking, Hey, I'm doing these things to lose a certain amount of weight. And then I'll go back to quote normal. It's like, this is a way that I can eat and live and feel good. Like give my body optimal energy. You know, that's the other thing about getting older. Like when you're in your twenties, you can eat really healthy and you can eat like crap. And like, at least for me, I know not everybody, but like, I kind of mm-hmm. felt the same same way. Like I yeah. can get away with eating really crappy. Eating and drinking. Yes. I can't do that anymore. Right. Like I need vegetables every day to keep things moving through my body. Yes. Like it's not even like, oh, I feel guilty because I ate, you know, half a bagel at breakfast. So now I'm going to force myself to eat a salad at lunch. I'm like, I want to eat a salad at lunch so that I can keep my digestion moving. Yes. So, you know, just the mindset around that, like these are, this is a way for me to make choices that serve my body and still enjoy foods that I love Mm -hmm. and do it in a way that is sustainable and enjoyable and doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like something I'm sacrificing for a little while. So that was the biggest success for me. Yeah. And then, you know, it's not, it's not part of the goals of the program and I didn't go in with this mindset, but you know, around four or five weeks in, I noticed that my pants were fitting looser. You know, I was like, huh, this is like, I don't feel like by the time I get home at the end of the day, I don't feel like I need to unbutton my pants because they're so tight on my waist. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't weigh myself a whole lot because again, in this like year long journey of, you know, trying to heal that, I try not to fixate on the number, but I knew about where I was hovering. And so I got on the scale and, you know, I was about five pounds down. And then a couple weeks later at the end of the program, I checked again and it was still right around there, like despite some ups and downs. And so, you know, it's, and that's nice. Like it's nice to see that I'm on the scale, but like 
my clothes now continue to like fit a little better and feel better. And, Mm -hmm. and so that was really great as well for somebody who has chased a number for so long without really any real idea why to frame my mindset around just feeling good. And then having that be an outcome was really nice too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like the lesson from that is, yeah, I remember you messaging me. You're like, Laura, I didn't, I haven't weighed myself in like months, but like I just stepped on the scale because I've been feeling different and I, I lost five pounds. Like wasn't my goal, wasn't the intention, but here we are. And, you know, you also started walking daily. You gave yourself a goal, which was amazing that you took it upon yourself to just get into an exercise routine and create that for yourself. And, you know, the lesson here is like when you focus on the process, creating a higher quality of life, improving your sleep, decreasing stress, showing up for your body and nourishing it and drinking water and like these basics, you will move in the direction where your body wants to feel better and carry itself better and not hold on to extra weight that maybe it's been holding on to as a result of overeating or being sedentary or stress or things like that. And so your body starts to self-regulate, right? Even without that intention of fat loss at a certain point. So now cravings goes over and we are in slim six, but I want to definitely keep focusing on the cravings code. And the goal of the cravings code was to help reduce cravings, hunger, and overeating by 70% and prime you for sustainable fat loss if that's something that our clients wanted. So now how are you doing things differently? And you've talked a lot about your mindset, um, but how are you approaching like your days differently? You've talked a little bit about having breakfast and having lunch. It could be eating out or your body image or your fitness goals. How have things changed? Yeah, I, I'm i glad you mentioned eating out just now because that was another huge turning point for me in Cravings Code was like being able to go. I took my daughter to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I remember that. And like to put together a satisfying meal at Chick-fil-A. I was like, yeah, hey, yeah this is amazing. Right? So I think what I would say is how I'm approaching days differently is, and I, I think I've said this a few times as we've talked, it's the idea that I can naturally and intuitively make choices, food choices, movement choices that serve my body. And it doesn't have to feel restrictive, right? Like I'm not hating my body into a certain way. Like I'm loving myself Mm -hmm. into health and to feeling good. Yay. Yeah. So I think, I mean, that's how it is, right? I wake up with the mindset every day and I make choices with the mindset of, you know, from a positive place instead of a negative one. Yes. I love that. And it's not perfect, right? Like we've had a few conversations where I'm like, oh my gosh, this got worse again. I suck. And you're like, no, you know. <laughs> so it's a work in progress. And that's been, that's been a big uh, light bulb for me moving into Slim Six is like the work with Cravings Code is the the beginning. And I feel really mm-hmm. comfortable continuing to implement those tools and I'm still working those. I'm getting rid of over 30 years of diet culture. Yeah. So it's a constant reminder. And I feel very much in a way that I've never felt before that I have those tools to rely on and they fit me and they feel good. Like when I start to catch my mindset being in the wrong place, I have the tools to get it back to where I want it to be. Mm, mm. That's almost more important sometimes than the actual day-to-day work, right? Like, because craziness is going to happen, stressful days, we're, we're going to go on vacation, we're not going to be able to go food shopping, there's going to be family stuff that comes up that's going to take us out of our routines, going to take us out of our comfort zone of, you know, I got my status plates, got my kitchen, got all my meals. And so we need to be able to say, all right, it's okay. A couple days of, you know, more crave foods or a couple days of maybe not exercising. It's all right. Right. In the grand scheme of my life of the next 30, 40, 50 years, a couple days isn't going to kill me. Right. And I think that's like, like that's one of the best things about that, that I can hear is like, I can be off track a little bit, but I can use these tools to get back on track and, and feel like I can stay consistent with my habits and my goals. And um, speaking of Slim Six, I do really value so, so Slim Six is sort of like the continuation uh, to the cra- cravings code for for women that are interested in slimming down without counting, tracking, or or measuring. And Trish joined, and you know she did her first set of measurements and photos, and then very quickly she said to me, you know, like I just don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. It's really triggering to me, and I'm actually going to honor. And this is what you told me in our Instagram messages, even in January. 
I want to focus on lifestyle habits and setting good examples for my kids and building in these routines of improving my quality of life. And I am so like proud of you that you said that to me and so proud that you realized that for yourself and that you honored that for your journey and for your process. And so uh, if you want to share at all on that and... Yeah, sure. So I think in retrospect now, I think why Cravings Code worked so well for me is I took the goal of weight loss out of my brain. You know, it wasn't this like something to be achieved. And so, you know, I was just focused on strategies. And so something sort of switched in my brain moving into Slim Six And I, first of all, like the continued accountability, the continued support, the additional strategies, so extremely helpful where I got tripped up was changing my mindset. Mm. And so I had to kind of say, just because I'm learning some fat loss strategies doesn't mean that I need to change my goal to be focused on this specific number again. Totally. And that's kind of what, that's where I had a little bit of a backslide. And some of it was, you know, adding in the strength training, which I had been wanting to do. Okay. Well, then my hunger was up and that will trigger a well, I'm weak because I'm hungrier. Okay, no, your body is trying to build muscle and it needs more. Yeah. But exactly to your point, I think the ability to recognize that and then say, you know, I can approach these strategies, whether it's Cravings Code or Slim Six from a lifestyle perspective. And it doesn't have to be about a number. It doesn't have to be about a pants size. It's about how I want to live my life. And from a strength perspective, you know, I've noticed... It's harder to like roll around on the ground with my kids. Like for sure, again, getting into my later thirties, I haven't been strength training as much when I have young kids and my strength, like I'm losing muscle strength. Mm -hmm. I can tell, you know, all of a sudden for again, the first time in my life. So I'm like, I got to get on that because that's not going to get any easier. So bringing back those goals, right? Okay. Like I have these lifestyle goals around eating because it serves my body and I need to have that same mindset around movement and exercise lifestyle goals, right? Like Mm -hmm. this is going to help my body be the best it can be for the way I want to live my life. Right. The process, the steps, right? Versus that end goal. And that's something we talked about in our call last night when we talked about strength training and pre and post-workout nutrition is like if we focus on these steps, right? If we focus on building strength and fueling our bodies properly, you will achieve the aesthetic goals that maybe you've we've all been vying for our whole lives of feeling fit and feeling strong and feeling athletic and, you know, maybe having a lower body fat percentage. But I, again, really appreciated you sharing that and bringing that up. And, you know, we have to be honest that we've been conditioned for a really long time uh, with some of these unhealthy thoughts and the way that we relate to our bodies and food. And so we have to be honest with what's right for ourselves so that we can have the best process and the, and the best experience in this. So thank you for bringing that up and sharing that. Yeah. Well, I know we were going to say, I was like, we're going to talk for like 15, 30 minutes and here we are at an hour. So I, I hope I'm not keeping you too long. No, it's fine. I can, I'm a talker. So. <laughs> oh no, please. Like me too. It's fine. Last few questions here. So What would you tell someone that was thinking of joining the Cravings Code if it was a friend or maybe someone that reached out to you on Instagram was like, Trisha, I heard you on Laura's podcast and I'm really thinking of joining, but like, would it be right for me? And would you recommend it? What would you say? Yeah. So I think, you know, my biggest hesitation, which I think is true for a lot of people is investing the money, right? Like, especially if you've done other programs that cost money and not seen it through. And so I think I would say for me, it was 100% worth it, 150% worth it because, and it wasn't, it's not about the, the content itself is so helpful, but the accountability, right? Like you can go buy a course online. You can look up information at the library, but having Laura's support through this process was the difference maker for me. And to me, that's worth investing in, I would do it 10 times over again. Aww. Join the program and get that accountability to guide you through because that's what's going to make the difference. Yeah. And have you worked with other coaches before? Um, No, okay, not really. I did personal training like just for straight, like long time ago in my 20s, I worked with a personal trainer for a little while, but not any time recently. Okay. Other than again, like through Noom, you know, they like check it, you know, got it. Nothing near as personalized as what you offer. Okay. And 
you know, not to put you on the spot, but if you were to describe my coaching approach to anyone, what would you, how would you say I relate or approach or coach clients? Oh, I love that question. Who you are resonated with me. And I think that's important for anybody, right? Like your story was one I could relate to and the resources that you offer felt like they fit for me and my lifestyle. So I think that's Mm -hmm. important for people first is like, is there a match? Like if you're, if you're really super interested in a coach, that's going to like, you know, ask you to submit your macro count every single day, like that might not be a fit for this exact program. So I think that's part of it. But what, what I really found about you, Laura, is that you meet people where they're at and provide them support that maybe they don't, know that they need, you know, Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. um, it's really relational. It's really personalized. I feel like you're available asking questions, checking in, you know, we messaged a few times back and forth, even before I joined the program. So it wasn't like you have to be my client for me to even talk to you, which I really appreciated. Right. Yeah. So I think, and you keep it real, you know, which I think is really nice. Like it's very realistic, you know, it's not Mm -hmm. this, you have to create a gourmet meal and here's 800 recipes with 1200 steps. Like it's just like, this is how life exists. So yeah. I don't know know that exactly answers the question, but no, I think it, I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful. I think some people might want coaches that are maybe a little bit more authoritative or like a little bit more tough love or a little more, you know, my way or the highway. I feel like I lead with a little bit more empathy and to your point, meeting people where they're at. And I am a realist in many ways. So I just feel like this got to work for you, right? I could tell you what works for me, but like, that's not going to, that's not going to work for you. You know, I am single. I don't have kids. And for me to sit here and tell a mom of two to eat how I do, or, you know, do what I do isn't realistic. So yeah, I think that's important to just, you know, let people know how we do over here. I like that you said some people like, like the tough love. I think that to me, I've never been responded to that because I'm already harder on myself than anyone else could ever be. Mm -hmm. And so that's also what I love about you is like when I'm hard on myself, you bring me back to reality. Yeah. That's been really helpful. Do you consider yourself a perfectionist? Totally. A hundred percent. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I'm a recovering perfectionist. For a long time, I was like, this is all these ways is how it's got to be. And if it's not that, then it's just literally not good enough in athletics and work and relationships. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had a coach who showed me that it was more about imperfect action than perfect stalled decisions. (laughs) And slowly I've, I've learned how to break down some of that perfectionist uh, mentality. And, And hopefully with this, it can show you that imperfect action is almost better than uh, trying to get things perfectly because there's there's no perfect way of eating. It's just what, what works for you. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else that you want to share that we haven't talked about, uh, which I find hard to even believe because we've talked about so much, but any final thoughts that you want to share? No, just, you know, thank you for your content that you share with people for the program for, you know, being a coach and a friend through this process. I really appreciate it. Of course, of course. And thank you again for sharing your story and being so open and transparent. And I'm just so excited for you. Like, honestly, like this is the beginning of the rest of your life. And I just can't wait to stay in touch and and keep hearing about all your successes and, and keep cheering you on. Thank you. Me too. Of course. You're welcome. 